is uh, we're going to talk about JavaScript performance tuning secrets. So this is uh, not so much about how to structure your code in a way that it runs quickly. It's more about the tools and techniques that you can use to begin to evaluate and investigate performance issues. Uh, and so I'm assuming that you're sort of familiar already with the basic stuff in the dev tools, like the timeline panel and the profiler. Um, this is going more into sort of more exotic, crazy stuff that you might not be as familiar with. Some of it's a little hacky, some of it's a little bit tricky and, and, and all that to get working. Um, but if you're really in a tough bind with performance and you're just desperate for one little clue, one little scrap of information that might lead you to an improvement and a fix, uh, these are good tools to have in your toolkit. Uh, so because this talk is pretty short, I'm going to fly over a lot of different material. I'm going to try to post up uh, some links to further reading uh, on this GitHub repo, uh, along with the slides. There's nothing there yet, but uh, hopefully by this weekend there will be. Um, so. Uh, me, real quick, uh, I started doing uh, professional web development uh, back when Firefox was in 1.0 beta, back when uh, WebKit's JavaScript engine sucked so badly that you couldn't do anything with it. Um, things have really come a long way since then. These days, uh, I work at Adobe on the Brackets team. Brackets is an open source code editor that we're building for web developers. It's also written in JavaScript, and it's a pretty, pretty serious uh, app. The Brackets UI is about 100,000 lines of JavaScript code. That's over 10 megabytes of JS files. So it's a very performance intensive app, and uh, that's kind of where I'm coming from on all this stuff. So um, first of all, why is this even a complicated problem? I mean, it seems like, sort of naively, you could just do something like this, right? You, you record a start time, you do some stuff, you record an end time, you know how, how long it took, right? And we're using the, these higher resolution performance uh, measuring APIs that are in modern browsers. You get sub-millisecond accuracy. It's really cool. Um, but I think there's basically two big problems with this. The first is that you know, a lot of times your JavaScript is running in the browser, and when you're running in the browser, there's a lot of other stuff that happens after this code is done, like that, or that, or that, or that. So if what you actually care about is how long it takes before the user gets feedback visually on screen, the browser-native rendering stuff is actually very important. And that's often the bottleneck these days, because JavaScript is so darn fast that uh, the browser-native side can actually be the bigger performance issue. Um, so that's one issue. But then, of course, also, you know, lots of people run JavaScript like on, on the server or in helicopters or other crazy stuff. And uh, regardless of where you're running, I think the second issue comes into play. And that is that JavaScript's not actually what's running on the CPU, right? There's this, this mystery black box, this JavaScript VM, that does a bunch of magic and makes your code run. And, and that's actually what's running on the CPU. And for, form, for per performance sensitive code, what goes on in that black box can be really important. Getting deeper insights into there is valuable. So I'll talk about those two topics in turn. First, kind of like getting intertangled with browser native rendering stuff. And then uh, second, the interaction between JavaScript and the VM it's running in. Um, I'll go through a number of topics in each of these. They're arranged roughly in ascending order of craziness. Um, so we'll, we'll go down the left column first, then we'll go down the right column. And, uh, and then I'll have a little bit of miscellaneous stuff at the end to wrap up. So um, first of all, who hasn't seen the timeline panel and is willing to admit it in front of everybody here? Anyone? <laughs> No, I'm brave enough, OK. Uh, but that's good. And so hopefully everybody knows about this frames view, which is, I think, the, uh, uh, the most powerful visualization you can get in there for things like animation performance, scrolling performance, anything that's really rendering oriented. Um, OK, so hopefully everyone's familiar with that. But here are some things you might not know about the timeline panel. First of all, you can actually add your own custom annotations to this panel. So if you do console.timestamp, you actually get these tick marks uh, that show up both in the overview of the whole timeline capture and also in the individual zoomed in view. You can also use slightly different code, uh, console.time and time end, to actually insert your own little bars in the view. So you can basically begin to layer on uh, semantic annotations that are specific to your code. So it makes the data much easier to parse. You're no longer looking at this really generic, sort of blind view that the browser gives you of what's going on. You can now actually begin looking at this in terms of what it means in your, in your app, which is pretty, pretty cool stuff. Um, but one of the things that's always bothered me about the timeline panel is that it's this very manually driven workflow, right? Like you load your page, you have to click around in it, you record some data, you scrub through it in the timeline. Uh, it's not really conducive to things like continuous integration where you might want to be you know, checking for per performance regressions automatically on every check-in, things like that. But it actually turns out there is a way to do that. So this may not be widely known, but uh, the timeline panel, in fact, everything in the developer tools in, in Chrome and WebKit is uh, built on top of an open API that's just in JSON format, and exp it's exposed as a socket connection. So anyone can connect to that remote debugging API. In fact, in the brackets editor, we, we use that API for things like live development. 
And Google has actually built a testing framework on top of this called the telemetry framework. Um, it's basically a collection of Python scripts and, and templates for test cases uh, that uh, let you do automated performance testing using the same data feed that the timeline panel gives you, except in an automated way. It actually includes some, uh, some pretty powerful UI automation capabilities. So you can do things like simulating clicks and, and scrolling. Scrolling is a particularly tricky one to simulate normally from JavaScript. So actually what they do here is that there's a, there's a special API that is turned off in Chrome normally that when the telemetry framework runs Chrome, it passes a flag that enables a special API just for simulating scrolling accurately to get really good performance data there. So it's really cool stuff. Um, and briefly, the way it works is you, you write it up a JSON file that has like a list of URLs and a list of actions in the URLs and what you want to test in them. You know, you can scroll different parts of the document, click on different uh, DOM nodes, that sort of thing. Uh, you need to get the Chrome source code. You don't need to compile it, but you get the scripts out of there. And then you run, you run these scripts. Uh, you pass it your JSON file. And, uh, and then it actually spits out a JSON file with performance data. So simple as that. Um, if you're looking for an example of how to use this, I think a great place to look is the Topcoat project which if anyone was at CSSConf, you would have seen a little bit about that there. It's an open source uh, uh, CSS uh, framework, basically. And they're very, very concerned with performance, rendering performance, load performance, all that. So they're doing automated testing using this telemetry framework. You can see a great example of how they use it there. And they've also built a spin-off project, which is the Top Code Server project. It's basically a node server that you can use to upload your performance results to. It will track the results over time. And it presents a really nice web view visualizing how your performance is varying over time. So that's a really great project you can make use of when you're using these APIs. Uh, also, um, there's some other cool stuff in the dev tools, the FPS meter, continuous repainting. These are really invaluable for assessing rendering performance. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on them here, though. There's a lot of great stuff you can read up on the Googles about this. Um, definitely very useful if you don't know about it. Similarly, uh, there's a, a mode where you can see repaint rectangles overlaid on the page, and there's a mode where you can see uh, compositing layers annotated with borders and, and grids on the page. Gives you really, really great deep insight into what's going on with browser painting on the one hand and browser compositing on the other hand. Um, but again, this is pretty well documented stuff, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on it uh, right here. The question actually that I'm going to talk about is what, if is what if this isn't enough? What if you need even more deeper insight into what's going on with uh, rendering and compositing in the browser. How many people have seen this view before? Few. How many people actually know how to read it? All right, cool. Uh, I was going to do a whole joker. If someone had their hand up, I was going to be like, put your hand down if you work at Google. That's cheating. But I guess no one here is from Google, so oh well. Um, so I'll give you a quick tour of this. Whoa, low resolution. OK. Um, this is a lot like what you see in the timeline panel, except it's broken down at a very low level by thread. Um, and so the first thing to know is that it's capturing everything that's going on in the browser, including all tabs you have open. So you want to close every other tab to get extraneous data out of here. And then you want to use the, uh, the task manager to actually identify uh, which, whoops, which, which uh, process ID you care about for your tab, because there's always going to be a few extra ones in here. I happen to know that for this uh, run that I already captured, the uh, thread that I care about is 6260. So I'm just going to go close all this extra stuff here that I don't care about. And I'll just leave a couple. The GPU one is useful to see also. So there are basically uh, two threads involved in rendering on any given browser tab. There's the compositor thread and the renderer thread, which is actually where the bulk of the work usually happens. That's where V8 runs your JavaScript. That's where layout happens. That's where repainting happens. Um, but this doesn't really look like much yet. If you look at this, it's actually a really big time scale. It's like a, a like three second capture. So it's just a big mash of stuff. We want to be able to zoom in. Uh, and the quickest way to do that is to hold down Alt and use the mouse wheel. And you can begin zooming in and start seeing this breakdown into individual, basically, frame per frame units. Um, to navigate further, you pretend you're playing Quake. And you use the A and the D key to pan horizontally. And you can use W and S to zoom in and out. So it's like a video game. It's a little, little crazy to navigate. And as we zoom in more, we can start seeing these individual frame by frame units. And if you look, they're broken down roughly in 16 and change millisecond intervals. So that's, this is one frame right here. And there's this characteristic U shape to it. So rendering uh, a, a given frame starts on the compositor thread. And the bulk of the work usually happens in the render thread. And then it basically wraps up on the compositor thread again. So when you see one of these U shapes, that's generally a single frame from start to finish. So um, 
the way that you actually read the data in here is this is basically a stack trace on the native side. So these are different methods um, that are running in, uh, in Chrome. There's run task, calls begin frame on main thread, which calls animate on the one hand, which calls into V8. That's request animation frame. Uh, calls layout after that. It calls update layers, et cetera. Um, so the width of the bar is how long it took. So you can begin to get a really good sense here of what's the self time versus the total time for a given method call uh, broken down at a really low level. The colors don't actually mean anything in particular. That was pretty confusing to me at first. Uh, they're just randomly assigned, but the same method consistently gets the same color everywhere that it appears. So it makes it much easier to sort of skim through repeated results uh, more easily. You'll also see there's a GPU thread down here, um, which is sometimes in sync with what's going on in your particular tabs, compositor, and render threads, but not always, because it's actually shared across the whole browser. Um, and so it's usually running at the same frame rate, but sometimes out of phase, which is one of the reasons that measuring, uh, rendering latency is a lot trickier than measuring, uh, rendering frequency or frame rate. Um, and actually on the GPU thread, this is, view is going to be enhanced in a, a future version of Chrome uh, as they do some rendering refactoring. It's going to add more and more tools to begin visualizing what's going on with GPU textures and individual repaint steps even. So it's, it's pretty powerful. Um, this is sort of a complement to the timeline panel, though it's not a replacement for it. In fact, there's some cases where the timeline panel gives you more information than what you see here. For example, if you uh, hover over a repaint in the timelines, it'll uh, show you overlaid on the page the bounds of the repaint. You can't get that from Chrome tracing. And same thing with layout. You can see the stack trace that caused the layout to happen. You don't get that from here either. But what you do get is this really, really in-depth thread-by-thread breakdown of what's going on in the GPU thread versus the compositor thread. And you can begin to see where bottlenecks are actually happening at a, at a more fine-grained level. So back before all these tools, though, uh, you know, measuring rendering performance in JavaScript was like comically bad. If you remember that earlier slide, there's all that stuff that happens outside of JavaScript. There's all this native stuff. So if you try to measure it from JavaScript, you get ridiculous results like this, where it's like off by 2x or 3x. It's just completely ridiculous, useless data. And back before things like the FPS meter and the timeline panel were well established, um, this is the kind of terrible data you got. And so this leads us to our last and craziest hack in the DOM rendering column. Back in the day, like say 2011, before there was an FPS meter available, uh, what could you do to get these orange bars, to get the actual accurate data when JavaScript is so far off the mark? Uh, and we developed, a number of people actually, we're not the only ones, we developed a really ridiculous idea that looks like this. Uh, that's not a regular SLR camera, that's a camera that shoots video at 600 frames per second. Uh, and of course, if you give engineers a toy like this, inevitably we're going to shoot some video that looks like this before we get any real work done. It's a, a guy breathing fire, obviously. Uh, but eventually we decided we should probably try to be uh, productive. And uh, we eventually decided to shoot video that looks more like this. This is me hitting a key as fast as I can, slow down 20 times. And you can see there's a noticeable delay between my finger striking the key and the character appearing on the screen. So you can get extremely, extremely precise information about things like rendering latency using this kind of technique. Obviously, this is a last resort. It's really uh, time consuming to do this. So you should prefer to use the timeline panel, the frame per second meter, request animation frame based timing, these more modern things that are available. But there are a few cases, I think, where this is still useful. Things like latency, for example, again, are trickier to measure. The frames per second meter tells you frequency, but not latency. Um, Another thing that's really powerful about it, though, is that it actually lets you measure uh, the performance of apps where you don't have access to the code. So I think we're very used to, in the JavaScript world, you can bring up any web page and pull up developer tools on it and start poking around in the code. But let's say you're building like a mobile website or a or Cordova-based mobile app, and you want to compare your performance against a native phone app that's your competitor. You don't have access to the native code. You can't instrument it. So a technique like this would actually let you measure the performance of the native app and compare that against your web-based app. So there are cases like that where, although this is crazy, as a last resort, it can still come in handy. All right, so we're done talking about the rendering column. Let's switch over and talk about things that go on inside of V8 now. Um, and I think that probably everybody knows about the profiler panel at least a little bit in V8, uh, or sorry, in the developer tools. Um, but actually, I think that for memory profiling, the timeline panel is a great first place to start. And there are four things that this gives you that are really, really handy. Uh, the first is you get this, if you switch to the memory view, you get this overview across the whole timeline capture of memory usage over time. So you can start to see patterns like memory leaks, right, increasing constantly. You can see excessive object churn if you're getting a GC sort of sawtooth too frequently. 
Uh, you also get this count at the bottom, which is counting uh, the number of uh, DOM-related objects specifically, which is one of the more dangerous sources of memory leaks because of how much uh, native browser stuff is prevented from getting freed by holding onto DOM objects. Um, then you can also see individual GC events uh, highlighted as individual tick marks here. So you can actually quantify how much time your JavaScript is frozen from being executed by a GC going on. And then lastly, for any individual yellow bar in the timeline that's showing JavaScript execution, recent versions of Chrome actually show you uh, the, the size of the number of objects that were generated during the execution of that JavaScript. So you can again start to get a sense of, of how much object churn is going on at a, at a pretty fine-grained level. Um, and then, of course, moving into the more standard memory profiling view, hopefully everybody knows you can, you can take a memory snapshot and begin delving into it. Something that might be a little less widely known, though, is that you can actually take multiple snapshots and diff them in this view. Uh, so this is really, really useful for looking at memory leaks. You can basically take one snapshot, do an operation that you expect to be memory neutral, like open and close something, and then take a second snapshot and get a diff. And all the un-GC'd objects hanging around between those two snapshots are red flags, are potential sources of memory leaks. So let's talk about CPU profiling, which is, of course, the other sort of JavaScript performance-oriented uh, side of the profiling world. This is getting a little more exotic. There's something that just landed in, in uh, Chrome Canary recently called the flame chart view. So if you capture a CPU profile, you can get this really cool visualization of the data. And what's nice about this is that unlike the normal CPU profile view, which buckets all of the entire profiling run into one data capture, this actually shows you how the hotspots vary over time. So there's two different panels here, basically, and, and it's a little tricky uh, to sort them out. But basically, the top panel here is an overview of the entire profile capturing run. And the spikes here are basically showing you JavaScript activity. So the y-axis is you know, increased CPU usage, essentially. And then you can zoom in on a particular part of that, like the highlighted area here. And you'll see along the bottom, you get this zoomed in view. And this, actually, the y-axis means something different, though. Here's where it gets confusing. The y-axis here is just, is just a, a stack, um, call stack, basically. So it's a lot like the Chrome tracing view, where it's a call stack. It's just actually flipped upside down in this case, but same difference. Um, so the, the x-axis here represents uh, time. So the wider the bar, the more time spent, just like the Chrome tracing view. So the, x-axis here roughly maps to the y-axis up in this other chart. That's a little confusing. The other thing that's potentially confusing about this is the color scheme combined with the name flame chart makes it sound kind of like a heat map, like red is bad and green and blue are good. That's actually not true at all. Uh, the colors here are just like Chrome tracing, where they're essentially randomly chosen colors that the same method gets the same color everywhere it appears just to make it easier to read. But the colors don't have any particular meaning other than that. So. If you want to start getting more sort of honing in on very specific you know, parts of your code base to target for performance profiling, there are two really cool ways that you can do that. Um, the first is you can use console.profile and profile-n to actually automatically kick off profiling sessions to get recorded in the dev tools and show up with your own label. You can actually have more than one of these running at once. They can be overlapping. They don't have to be strictly nested. Uh, so it's a really great way to begin you know, honing down on specific parts of your code without having to click the begin and end button manually right at the right times. And then also, uh, you can use console.time and time end to add custom annotations that show up in the Chrome tracing view. So there you can actually begin to see your own method calls, or your own time brackets basically precisely lined up with what's going on in the browser native side of things uh, in this really, really rich, rich uh, threaded view of what's going on. So again, you know, like the custom annotations in the timeline panel, these are really cool ways to begin adding your own annotations to a data set that normally is kind of blind to what your code means and is this very generic view. And here you can begin to make it much more specific to your own profiling needs, your own goals and targets. All right. Um, let's say none of that stuff is crazy enough. Let's dial up the craziness meter a little bit further here. Um, if that stuff isn't giving you enough information. It turns out that V8's profiler actually produces uh, a lot more info than what the dev tools show. And there are a few kind of crazy hacky ways that you can get at some of that richer info. Um, the setup for this is a little bit involved. That's why this is on the high end of the crazy spectrum. So I won't go through that in detail, but I'll, I'll post up those steps later. Um, but basically what you do is once you get that set up, uh, you close all instances of Chrome that you have open. That includes Canary and Stable if you happen to have both open. Thanks to uh, uh, John McCutcheon at Google for helping me figure that one out. It was very confusing. Close every Chrome process you can get your hands on. And when they're all closed, you go to the command line and you launch Chrome with these special flags. And they basically get fed through to V8 and uh, tells V8 to generate a log file. 
Then you dig out that log file and you run this plot timer events uh, script on it, which is part of the V8 source. Um, and it generates a ping file. It'll chug for a little while and spit out this ping file next to the log. Uh, and it looks like this. It looks a little bit like the Chrome tracing view, but rather than being concerned with browser rendering performance, this is all about what's going on on the V8 side of things. And you can get really, really fine-grained detail here. Like, for example, GC Compactor and GC Scavenger, you can actually see when GC activity is going on, when garbage collection is going on, is it garbage collecting from the young space or the old space? Is it basically, is it garbage collecting objects that were recently created and didn't live very long? Or is it getting rid of objects that hung around a long time and then all of a sudden all got freed at once? That can be a very, very interesting insight to have into what's going on <coughs> with GC performance problems. Another thing that's really cool in this view is uh, this bar that runs along the middle here, which tells you the kind of code being executed. And what that means is whether V8 is currently running optimized code or unoptimized code, which can be very, a very important problem if your code that's performance sensitive isn't getting optimized fully by V8. That can be a, a problem, and it can be sort of a mystery, too. Uh, and the way you tell it, by the way, is green is optimized. Red, full code, they call it, is, is unoptimized. This particular trace is not such a great example. It's, it's mostly neither. It's mostly not bottlenecked by JavaScript at all. But in things that are bottlenecking on JavaScript, you'll see a lot of either red or green, hopefully green, but maybe red. Uh, and so to begin looking at it, the first thing you need to do is actually zoom in on this data. Because if you look at this, it's capturing. It's really hard to see the numbers, but it's basically 14 seconds is the, the length of this capture run. It's the entire time that Chrome is up and running. Um, you don't get any, any control over how long it runs the capture over the whole time it's, it's up and running. So uh, to zoom in on this, you can pass some arguments to that, uh, the plot timer events function. And you can basically begin zooming in. So you can see now it's sort of starting to break down into these frame units again. Um, and you can zoom in even on a single frame and start to get really, really detailed information you know, down to the millisecond, basically, about what's going on inside of V8 at every little time slice. Uh, this is still kind of a crappy iterative process. Like You have to like, run the script and then relook at the ping file and run the script again and all that. I did come up with an interesting uh, hack for navigating this data more interactively. Um, it's a little tricky. It requires pulling a chunk of code out of the plot timer event script that you run and basically getting it to save its intermediate file before generating the ping. It turns out that the intermediate file that it uses to generate the ping is just a text format file that contains a bunch of drawing commands. And um, if you cross out the first line, if you delete that first line from the file, you can then open this in an interactive visualizer. So GNU plot is the thing it uses. You can, you can get interactive visualizers onto this GNU plot format data. And I'll show you a quick example of that. Uh, Here's where the, the control scheme from Chrome tracing, the video game style thing, starts to sound less crazy, because I find this even more bizarre. The way that you navigate this is you, you control mouse wheel to zoom in, which seems pretty reasonable. Um, and this is actually quite powerful, because, it's, because this is a data plotting software package, you notice it's smart enough to keep the axis labels in view, even as you zoomed in, which is pretty cool. Um, but the way that you scroll horizontally is you, see, I have to refer to notes is how crazy this is. You, have to, you hold down Shift, and you use the mouse wheel to scroll horizontally. And then to scroll vertically, you hold down Alt and use the mouse wheel. It makes tons of sense, right? It's such an intuitive way of navigating data. But it is, nonetheless, a much faster iteration than having to repeatedly look at the milliseconds and then rerun the script and open the ping file again and you know, rinse and repeat. So this is kind of a cool way to visualize the data. Um, of course, because this is just a text format, I think it would be really awesome if someone wrote like a JavaScript in D3-based visualization of this or something like that. I'll definitely buy a case of beer for anyone who uh, can sort that out, or for that matter, anyone who checks it into the dev tools. Hopefully one of those two things will happen, uh, happen soon. Um, so once you've actually zoomed in uh, enough and been able to identify some data there, and let's say you can actually see that some things aren't getting uh, optimized when you want them to be optimized, um, first, you don't know what code that actually is. You just see, can see a red bar, and you want to know what functions they are. So one way to get more info on that is to run that same log file through a slightly different command. It spits out a text file that looks like this. At first glance, this looks a lot like the data you get out of the regular DevTools profiler panel. It's just kind of a you know, top-down, heavy, heavy to light you know, uh, list of, of functions. But it has this extra little annotation. The asterisk is telling you that those functions are running optimized in the VM. The lack of an asterisk tells you that the function is running unoptimized. And that is probably the red bar you're looking at if you're seeing a lot of red in your code. It's going to be the heavy function that's not optimized. So now you know which function. The next question is, why is it not running optimized? Because that can be a total mystery. You could make random changes and see if it fixes things. But if you're really desperate, you'd like to get some kind of clue as to what's up and why it didn't get optimized. Uh, 
And that's where the third V8 logging trick comes in. You run Chrome with slightly different flags, and it, it actually barfs out a bunch of stuff to the console, so you redirect it to a text file. And when you search that text file, you start seeing things like this. And you can actually see names of some of your own functions in there, and it'll actually give you the reason in sort of shorthand. It'll give you the reason why that function was ineligible for being optimized, or maybe in some cases why it was optimized, and then later on kicked back and de-optimized because it violated some assumption that V8 was making about its control flow. Um, this stuff is, is, again, this is like on the extreme end of the crazy scale because of not only the complicated setup, but also the data file that you get here is pretty hard to parse through. The reasons that it lists are often pretty vague. And from what I've seen, it seems to not always list all of the functions that you expect it to list, so sometimes it may be missing information. Um, so it's pretty hard to parse through if you don't know the V8 source code, which I certainly don't. <laughs> um, but hopefully a lot of this data is going to begin bubbling up you know, into views like Chrome Tracing and even the, the DevTools proper uh, be, you know, as this stuff coming out of V8 gets richer and more stable. And there's just so much need for this to be exposed at a higher level. So I think we'll start seeing more of this uh, in the near future in actual UI-oriented tools. So with all that said, um, sometimes you should ignore everything I talked about. And in fact, everything anyone says about JavaScript performance. Because some things that, uh, sometimes there are reasons to not focus on JavaScript performance at all, but to focus on other things. So reason number one, I'll give you three, what I think are three good reasons to not be uh, always focused on JavaScript performance. Number one is that sometimes network I.O. performance is a much, much bigger issue. Page load time is often one of the number one complaints about slowness that users have. And that often has very little to do with JavaScript. Um, has to do with network performance and, and minimization, things like that. Uh, and there are a couple of really cool browser APIs that let you get at info about page load timing, like this one. That's information that is, is really hard to gather either on your server or using regular JavaScript without the help of this browser API, because you don't have insight into the whole flow from the time the user clicks a link to the time that this stuff renders on screen. The browser knows that whole timeline, and they can save the data and give it to you. You can also get data broken down by individual resources. So you can use these APIs to get at the uh, loading time of individual image files, individual script files, um, all that stuff. Uh, the working group that, oh, sorry, there's one other thing I was going to say about this, is that um, perceived performance is often more important than actual performance. So when you're talking to a server and the server might be slow, doing that in a way that's asynchronous and doesn't block any part of your page's UI is, uh, is a huge, huge win. If you look at the way that you know, things like Google Docs or Trello or, or Gmail do saves asynchronously in the background without blocking stuff, it makes it feel a lot faster, even though it could take several seconds for the server to actually respond. Um, Quick aside, the W3C working group that produced those resource timing APIs that I showed you on this slide here, uh, they're also beginning work now on a number of APIs for uh, rendering performance, for measuring that stuff programmatically. So they're beginning to basically standardize things like the uh, scrolling simulation API that I mentioned earlier with the Chrome telemetry stuff. So uh, I think we'll see a lot of cool stuff out of this working group in the future. This is also the group that produced request animation frames. So we've gotten a lot of good things out of them already, I think. Um, reason number two is that um, maybe your code is good enough already. Um, I think that sometimes there's a tendency in, in some parts of the JavaScript community to sort of jump the gun about performance. Uh, for example, if someone might see code like this and say, oh, geez, you can't do that. Look at this. You're entering a function closure every iteration of the loop. And I mean, look what jsperf.com says about this. It's way faster to just use a regular for loop. And while there's some truth to that, if you look at the time scale on these things, sometimes you're talking about the difference between 12 million, 12 million iterations per second and 80 million iterations per second. And if the context of your code is, for example, creating a menu, you know that that difference makes no difference, right? If you're only going to iterate a couple hundred, even a couple thousand times, uh, that's, that difference is just totally water under the bridge. So you know, it's not a best practice to make your code uh, harder to read or harder to maintain just for speculative performance gains. The best practice is to identify specific bottlenecks that your users actually care about and uh, make fixes for those in a targeted way. Lastly, reason number three. Um, Engineering time is a finite resource, and you should spend time on what's most important. So here are some things that might be more important than working on performance. It's a pretty good list, right? But sometimes performance really does matter, and when that is the most important thing to work on, I hope that the tools I showed you will make your life easier when you get desperate with performance stuff. Thanks for listening.